Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. Currently, we are looking at the armor of God. And uh, we began last week kind of in an introductory way to recognize a few things. First of all, that there really is a spiritual battle going on in the unseen realm around us that affects us. Uh, we're kind of pawns in that battle. Uh, that battle is for our soul. For those of us that are believers in Jesus, the devil can't have our soul. And so he wants to frustrate us and to keep us from being effective in the kingdom of God. And so we are kind of part of the arena of this unseen spiritual battle. So it's a very real battle. We also looked at the fact that we have a very clever enemy. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul said that um, he called it the schemes of the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, rulers, of darkness, um, you know, cosmic powers. And, and these are schemes, these are plans that he has for us. So what we did with most of our time last week, and you can go back and, and watch that video, is we, we looked at the devil's age-old tactic of trying to get us to doubt God's goodness, to mistrust God's word, to uh, look at God's word, maybe with just a little bit of skepticism or to ignore God's word. And if he can get our eyes off of God's word, and we're going to see more of that truth today, then half of his battle is already done. We also looked at the three areas of our life where we are most vulnerable to attack. Uh, the things that we feel, the things that we see, and, and our self-centered pride, and how the devil in the Garden of Eden attacked those three things, and how he'll attack that. Uh, he'll attack our flesh. Uh, he'll use our eyes to see things that look attractive to us that aren't God's will for us. And then uh, he'll He'll fill us with pride to want things our way. But the great truth of it all is that we learn that regardless of this inevitable battle and this very skilled adversary we have, victory is assured in Christ. Paul said, having done all to stand firm. And so that victory is guaranteed. Uh, Paul told the Corinthians, you know, that we uh, we have the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we could uh, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that uh, that work is never in vain. And he told the Roman church that we in all things are more than conquerors through Christ. So we wage an unseen spiritual battle, and many times we're not even aware that's going on around us. God wants us to be aware of it, but also he wants us to be aware that he has equipped us to be able to be successful in this battle, to be used by him in this battle, to bring glory to him in this battle. The battle belongs to him, but he's equipped us and has us ready. We're going to begin looking at the pieces of the armor today. We're going to look at the first piece of armor, the belt of truth. Now, truth is a casualty in our society today, I really do believe. Um, the devil has succeeded in blurring the lines of truth and causing people to doubt that there is absolute truth and it, to redefine truth according to their own definitions and desires. So truth is under attack. But we're going to see today how important God's truth is to the spiritual battle and to our success in spiritual battle. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 6, and today we're going to look at verse 14. So join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you for the goodness that you give to us. We thank, we're thankful that we do have victory because of the death and resurrection of your Son and our Savior, Jesus, that when he said it is finished on the cross, it was indeed finished. We're not in a war, we're not in a battle because this battle is over, but we still have this spiritual struggle, this wrestling that we have every day of our life, as long as we live here on this earth. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you would give us courage to put on the armor that you've given to us, uh, that we might be successful against all the schemes of the devil. He would not have any victory over us whatsoever, but that you would get honor and glory in our lives. For it's in Jesus' name, the one who makes it all possible, that we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's turn over to our scripture. 
As I said today, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, verse 14, beginning of verse 14. One thing I think it's important to uh, note about all of these pieces of the armor that God has given to us, uh, the order in which they are listed is not necessarily specific, uh, but I do believe starting with the belt is very important. Now, imagine with me, if you would, for a moment, Paul, when he's writing this letter, to the Ephesian church, he's sitting in a prison. He's being guarded by a Roman soldier. So imagine him watching this Roman soldier day after day, watching how this Roman soldier uh, is equipped to do his job, the uniform this soldier wears, and drawing spiritual comparisons from physical warfare and the physical responsibilities of the soldier to our role as soldiers for Jesus Christ, soldiers in this spiritual battle. So I know that Paul is um, really the Lord is using his situation to pre preach a precious truth to us. So let's dig into this and see what we have. So here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, or at least the first part of verse 14, here we read, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now, literally, this phrase means to gird up one's loins or their midsection. And it was kind of a colloquial um, phrase of their day, a figure of speech of their days, meaning to tie on a belt of some sort. I've heard this described sometimes in this passage of Scripture using a more secular description of the belt, where... Uh, uh, a typical Eastern man would be wearing a tunic covered by a cloak, and then that cloak would have some type of leather belt or rope belt tied around the middle, and that whenever the man needed to work, whenever he needed to move about freely, if he needed to run uh, or if he needed you know, to defend himself, he would gather the hem of that cloak, and he would kind of twist it around into a piece and tuck it in that belt that was tied around so it left his legs unencumbered and he could move about more freely. Well, that and that is true. That is a secular way. One girded up his loins. He would pull up um, the hem of his garment and tuck it in that belt so that he would be able to move freely. But a Roman soldier didn't wear a cloak uh, for the most part. A Roman soldier wore a tunic covered by this armor. And so the belt had kind of a different function for the Roman soldier. And I believe it's that specific function uh, that Paul wants us to notice. It, and having fastened on this belt, it's important to note that for this Roman soldier, the belt was very important to his entire uniform. It didn't, I mean, he wasn't wearing pants, he was wearing a tunic, so it wasn't to hold up his pants. The purpose of his belt, and I've kind of got a picture here. Uh, I'll show you. This is kind of the Roman soldier arrayed in his uniform, and this is his belt. You see the leather tassels with metal studs it had on it that were kind of jingle jangle, letting people know he was coming. Uh, but this belt uh, had places for, for most of the other pieces of the armor, pretty much everything except the shoes attached in some way to the belt. The belt, this is the breastplate that we'll look at later. Uh, the breastplate attached down here at the bottom to the belt so that the breastplate would not ride up. Imagine the soldier being in hand-to-hand -hand combat and somebody taking his breastplate and pushing it up into his neck and cutting off his airflow. It would be a very dangerous thing. Uh, you see he's holding in his hand here a sword, and you can barely see by the side a dagger. Uh, there were holsters for both of those. Uh, on his belt so that when he didn't need to hold them in his hands, his hands were free. Uh, you see this large shield, and we're going to look at the shield of faith a little later and what all that means. There was a place in the back for that shield to clip on so that if he didn't need to carry that shield, again, his hands were not encumbered by it. And then you notice this helmet that is here, very significant in his helmet. And there was also a place on his belt where he could hang his helmet when he didn't need to wear it. So the belt was very important. All of the other armor was held in place and secured 
by the belt. So what does that teach us about the function? It is a belt of truth. Now let's think about that a moment. We looked at the function of the belt. What about the material the belt was made from? Truth. In our last episode, when we talked about the devil's schemes, one of his greatest tactics, I think his most successful tactic, is to get us either unclear about what God's word says, so that we don't really know what it says, what he said to Eve in the garden. Did God really say this? Or to, um, to doubt that God's word has enforcement behind it or that God really meant what he said. He told Eve, oh, you'll not really die. And to doubt God's intentions. God just doesn't want you to be as smart as he is. He doesn't want you to be wise like him. And the only way to counter, remember, the devil is a liar. Uh, one time Jesus talking about the devil said that he is a liar and the father of lies and that when he lies, he is speaking his native language. I love that terminology that Jesus used. The devil is a liar. So what is the antidote for lying? But truth. When the devil comes at us with lies, the way we encounter his lies is not with our human reasoning, not trying harder just to forget about it or not think about it, but to smash him with truth. When Jesus was tempted in the Garden of Eden, the devil misused God's word to try to tempt Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He hit him every time with Bible truth. From Deuteronomy chapter 6 of all places, truth. And so Everything that we're going to find, this breastplate of righteousness, this helmet of salvation, the, the feet of the readiness of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, all of that we take as truth. If we don't wield those pieces of armor in God's truth, then they are of no avail to us. So truth is essential, and that's where we start. We start with truth. And I can't write that in big enough letters. Truth. Truth. <laughs> okay. Now, where do we get this truth? Notice what Jesus, this is Jesus's great, uh, we call this Jesus's high priestly prayer. You find it all in John chapter 17. And this was right before Jesus was crucified. This is the prayer he prayed when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, this is the prayer he prayed while James, and John, and Peter were asleep. This is the prayer he had just finished praying when Judas brought the Roman soldiers to get him and betrayed him. And part of that prayer, he said, sanctify them in the truth. Now, notice the definite article here. Because what people will try to tell us today is, well, you've got your truth, I've got my truth. Truth is relative. Um, I even like it when they say this, there is no absolute truth. Now, do you understand the non sequitur of that statement? To say there is no absolute truth is to utter what you believe to be an absolute truth. And so you are automatically contradicting your own statement and your own belief when you say that. But they, they still throw that out there. So now what they're instead of saying there's no absolute truth, they say, well, truth is relative. You know, what's true for you may not be true for me, and what's true for me may not be true for you. But over and over, the Bible stresses the truth. There is an absolute truth, and it's found where? In the word of God. Your word is truth. Sanctify. Set them apart. Make them different. Help them to grow. Help them to be who they are intended to be through your word. There is, I want to write this because I want you to see it, there is no magic pill for spiritual success. No magic pill, no secret sauce, whichever one of those is your favorite euphemism. 
it comes through knowing God's word. God's word is truth. It is his truth that sanctifies us. So when we think about this belt of truth, as we begin to prepare ourselves for spiritual battle, we need to make sure that we are armed in, that we are girded with God's truth. in his word, girded with God's truth in his word. As I said earlier, the belt kind of, um, every other piece of the armor depended on the belt. So everything we're gonna see about spiritual battle, it, it has to be based on God's truth. So what I wanna close this out with today is I wanna give us three encouragements about this truth. Since truth is so vital, to our, our spiritual success, uh, to us being successful, not being frustrated and derailed by the devil's attack. Since, since truth is absolutely vital in our spiritual battle, three things. First of all, know the truth. In John 8, 31 to 32, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. That's cause number one. And cause number two, you will know the truth. And cause number three, the truth will set you free. Abiding in God's word is discipleship. Uh, that is how we become a follower of Jesus. That is how we become like Jesus by abiding in his word. Now, let me tell you what abiding in his word does not mean. It doesn't mean, oh, yeah, we read the Bible every now and then, or that we 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 remember the Bible verses, sort of, uh, that we memorize as a kid, and we can quote them at least partially. Abiding means that we read it, we study it, we meditate on it. God's word surrounds us. It's on our thoughts. It's in our heart throughout the day. God's word is shaping us. That's how we become like Jesus, and that's how we know the truth. We become so aware of truth by immersing ourselves in the truth of God's word that we then are free to spot anything that is not true. We don't fall for the devil's lies. He can't trick us into believing him because we know what real truth is. That doesn't come just from listening to preachers. That doesn't come just from listening to Christian music. That doesn't come just from reading Christian books and devotionals. That comes from opening God's word ourselves, looking at what God has said, Asking, okay, God, what are you? What were you saying in that, and how does this apply to my life today? What do you want me to do with this? Abiding, know the truth, abide in the truth. The second thing then is to grow in the truth. Now, Peter told those disciples who were scattered abroad throughout Asia Minor, like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk. Feed on God's word. Now, you can read uh, the context before and after First uh, Peter two and 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 two and see that that when he's talking about spiritual milk, he's talking about the Bible. And we grow up in our salvation. Not we don't not to receive salvation. But to. advance in our faith. We learn more. We grow stronger. Uh, we see more of the devil's lies. We're not as vulnerable to temptation uh, because we're strong. We're nourished. We're fed. So grow in truth. Abide in truth. Grow in truth. And then finally, live the truth. This comes from the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has just preached uh, a three. what we have is a three-chapter sermon his kingdom manifesto, uh, what it's like to be a kingdom follower of Jesus. 
And this is his conclusion. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. Now let's, let's make some distinctions. Hears these words of mine and does them. He is a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So the word picture that Jesus is drawing for us here is that in his word, the truth of his word, building our life on the foundation of his word, establishes us for whatever comes our way. But he goes on to say, but, or and, everyone who also hears these words of mine, but does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and it beat against that house. It beat against it. That's an important distinction for us to make, is that it, the cultural norms of today are, are counter to the word of God. When we live by the word of God, we choose to obey Jesus, we will be going upstream. We'll be going against the flow. We won't be rolling with the flow, all right? We'll be going against the flow. The storm went against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So choose to know the truth, grow in the truth. And then as tr God begins to reveal truth to you, apply it to your life and live in it. So I know you say to me, would, would say to me, well, Brother Jim, you talk about Bible study all the time. That seems like that's all you ever talk about. And I know that I do a lot. And the reason I do that a lot is because I believe that is reading the Bible and being in prayer. Those are the two single most important disciplines to be successful in this spiritual skirmish, the spiritual struggle that we face every day. We'll constantly be frustrated. We'll trip up. We'll fall. We'll give in to temptation, and then the devil makes us feel like dirt because of it. Well, there I go again, sinning again. I just, I can't help myself. And he just kind of really works on our conscience. For that, we need grace. For that, we need to recognize the grace of God covers that when we sin, not if we sin. When we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and that's Jesus. Uh, he has paid for our sin, but wouldn't it be better if we grow stronger and stronger and wiser and wiser in the truth that we recognize the devil's lies and that we are armed with the antidote to that lie? And when he comes into our head with a lie, we say, well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not from God, because the reality of what God said is this. When there's doubt, we bring in faith. Uh, when there's um, guilt, we bring in grace, so forth and so on. Every lie the devil tells you has a corresponding truth in Scripture with which we can put away that falsehood. And stand, having done all to stand, stand firm. So that's why. I harp on studying your Bible, reading your Bible, knowing your Bible. Equip yourself. Put on your belt. Put on your belt of truth because everything else you're going to need to be able to withstand the devil's onslaught against you is dependent on the fact that you are deploying that armor from a position of God's truth. If you put it on wrong and it's not attached to truth, it's going to mess you up. We're going to refer to that quite often with, with each, uh, each of the pieces of armor. We're going to come back to this belt of truth and how truth is so vital to it. But that's enough for this episode. What are you doing about Bible study? Are you intentional about Bible study? Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you writing down what God says to you so that you can remember it? Are you applying it? Are you praying and asking God to, to make it a reality in your life? We are in a very real battle against a very clever enemy. 
but we have been sure, assured of victory through a risen Savior, Jesus. And by abiding in his word, his truth will set us free in this battle. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next time.